It's certainly a privilege to be back together this morning as we come to the final day of this gospel meeting. It's gone fast, at least for me. For you, you may be thinking it's been very long, with the, but hopefully uh, if you've been a part of the meeting, it's, it's been one that has benefited you. And we're going to finish up today on our little uh, theme of going back to the basics. We've covered, as you remember, beginning on Wednesday, the eternal God. We talked about Jesus Christ, uh, the Word of God, last night on salvation from sin. And today, what we plan to cover, this morning, the church that Jesus built. And then this afternoon, we'll talk about when the church assembles. You know, Jesus made a promise long ago, upon this rock, I will build my church. We're going to talk about that promise as we look at it. And to kind of help us get there, I want you to imagine uh, for a moment that you're present in the days of Noah. And as we think about that, we'll be covering as we kind of make some comparisons between Noah and the ark and the church, we're going to talk about what is the church and what we call the six P's. We'll talk about the descriptions that are given in the Bible about the church, the destiny of the church, and then how do you become a member of the Lord's church? But if you can imagine that you're present in the days of Noah, the sun is shining, the skies are clear, it's never rained a day in your life. Mitts came up and watered the plants. People are going about their usual business. They're tending their fields, selling in the marketplace, making plans of one kind or another. But on this particular day, something very strange occurs. That preacher named Noah that usually comes into town hasn't shown up this day in preaching about this stuff about repentance and the end of the world. Oh, many times you've looked upon that monstrosity called an ark and Noah as he's busy building, but you happen to glance up on the mountain that day and you notice something strange happening. The door begins to slowly close and nobody's there closing it. It seems to be closing all by itself. The sky suddenly grows dark. From a distance, you see that the water level is beginning to rise quickly. You find yourself frantically running and slipping up that muddy slope to the ark. And your heart is beating faster and faster as you pound upon the side of the ark, begging to be let in, along with thousands of other people that are doing the other things and are yelling among, amidst the cracks of thunder. But as the water continues to rise and finally surrounds your head, you want more than anything to be in that boat. But unfortunately, it's too late. The door has been shut. Well, that's just kind of a, an example in the Bible of this arc of safety that we want to talk about. For us, it's not too late. and We can enter this arc of safety today. Now, the arc back then... I think furnishes us a really good picture of Jesus Christ and His church today. Noah built the ark. Jesus Christ built the church. Noah and his family made the choice to enter the ark. We make the choice to become a part of Jesus and be added to His church. No one was saved outside the ark that day. And today we're going to learn that the saved are in Christ's body. They're in the church that Jesus built. Noah entered the ark by the one and only door. And today, we enter the church through the one and only door, and that door is Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Now today, there are a lot of ideas about the church. When you hear the word church, what do you think of? If someone said, church, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Hopefully not potluck, you know. But uh, what pops into your head as you think about it? Somebody might say, well, it's a building with steeples. Another might say, it's a congregation of people. Well, it's something that people go to or something that people attend. But I wonder, is that what Jesus had in mind when Jesus said so long ago, I will build my church? Imagine for a moment if we could go back in time, 
We could get in a time machine and travel back to the first century and start talking to people about what it's like to live in the 21st century. We tell them about something called electricity. We talk about artificial intelligence. We tell them about the internet. We uh, tell about all these things that are going on and they'd look at you like you're some foreigner and you don't know what you're talking about. They'd have no understanding at all. Explaining first century concepts to 21st century people can be just as foreign and just as strange. And I think that's certainly true when we talk about the first century church. Because for a lot of people, all they've ever known is 21st century religion with denominationalism, shopping for a church to meet your desires, and it's foreign to them to think that Jesus built His church and that we can be members of it. Well, let's go back to the first century. And let's spend some time learning about the church that Jesus built. We don't need a time machine. We just need to open our Bibles and take a look at it this morning. Someone said, and I think they're probably right, there's really only two subjects that are talked about in the New Testament. Only two. One is Jesus, and the other is the church. I don't know if you've ever thought of it that way, but that pretty well sums up the New Testament, doesn't it? When you think of the church, whatever you think of the church is equal to what you think about Jesus Christ, because the church is the body of Christ. Ephesians 5.23, Christ is the head of the church, and He's the Savior of the body. So what is the church? Well, if you've been around very long, you've heard the word ekklesia. That's the, uh, the Greek word for the word church. Ek means out of, and the latter part of the word means a calling. So the word church in the original means the called out. Now here's something that we need to understand. With the Greeks, this word had no religious significance whatsoever. It was applied to any kind of crowd or any kind of assembly. For example, the word ecclesia is applied to a howling mob in Acts 19.32 when the, they cried one thing, some another, for the assembly was confused. That's the word ecclesia. Stephen used the word ecclesia to refer to Israel as a congregation, or in the King James, the church in the wilderness. That's the word ecclesia in Acts 7, 38. They were literally called out of Egypt. Now I wonder, why would Jesus choose this word ecclesia to say, I'm going to build my ecclesia. I'm going to build my called out. Are his followers called out of anything? Well, it doesn't take long to read your Bible to know that we are. In John 15 and verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the worlds, therefore the world hates you. You know, Jesus calls us out of something else. He calls us out of darkness. The Word of God reminds us in 1 Peter 2 and 9 that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. We need to understand that Satan's kingdom is darkness. And you know, Satan does his best work in the dark. He does his best work in secrecy. And sometimes we live, uh, or we live secret lives. Or there's compartments of our life that we want to keep hidden. And if we bring those things out into the light, that's how we gain the victory. Satan doesn't want things out in the light. He wants you to keep your secret life. He wants you to keep those compartments of your life that nobody else knows anything about quiet and let no one know because that's where he likes to work. His is a kingdom of darkness. Colossians 1 and verse 13 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us in the kingdom of the Son He loves. I haven't seen the movie, but they tell me there was a movie years ago about pirates. There's one scene in that movie where this sweet, innocent young lady is talking to the pirate that she had fallen in love with. 
and she's crying her eyes out and she's saying, I can't believe it. You deceived me. You, you lied to me. And he looked at her and he said, pirate. And I can't help but have an image of the day of judgment and people that are crying and saying, devil, you deceive me. Devil, that's what I do. I'm a liar. You know, what'd you expect? I do my best work in the dark. I'm a liar and the father of lies. When I speak, I'm talking my native language. What are you crying about? I'm a devil. Well, ecclesia can also mean assembly, a congregation. And that's the word we find in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12. In the midst of the assembly, the ecclesia, I'll sing praise to you. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. Now, all of us that have been members of the church for very long recognize that there are two ways, at least, that the church is referred to in Scripture. Actually, more than that, we'll talk about that this afternoon. But what I want to talk about briefly is, of course, and I'm not going to spend much time on it, you've got the universal church and you've got the local church. Mr. Vine in his dictionary talked about the word ecclesia can refer to the whole company of the redeemed, of which Jesus said, I'll build my church. And then under B, he says it also in the singular number to a company consisting of professed believers. Jesus used it universally. I'll build my church. It's used as a local church or assembly uh, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. And sometimes it's used to refer to local congregations in an area like the churches of the Northwest, for example, or like the churches of Galatia in the Bible. And so these are some ways that the word church is used in Scripture. But I think one way to study this this morning is to talk about the six P's. There are six words that begin with P, and we're going to take a look at them just briefly this morning. The church number one was purposed. We talked about that in detail last night as we covered the great salvation. God had the church in mind from the beginning of time that He would send His Savior. He would publish the gospel. He would establish the church and unite Jews and Gentiles. And according to Ephesians 3 and 11, this was all according to His eternal purpose, which He purposed in Christ Jesus. But not only that, the church was prepared just like uh, the ark was prepared, God prepared the church. First Peter 3 and 20, uh, back to the story of the ark, Peter said, God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. God was very patient as the ark was being prepared. God is patient today and He's prepared everything for the church. You know, in God's old covenant with Abraham, this most important biblical event, when God called Abraham, the rest of the Old Testament is recording, it's a record of that covenant, the development of that covenant. Now I want you to look at something that's I think kind of interesting. God made a covenant with Abraham. In Genesis 12, it's recorded. The Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now the rest of the Old Testament is developing that theme. But I want you to look at this. There are four promises, at least four, that are found within that covenant that God made with Abraham. First of all, there's a land promise. Go to the land that I will show you. There's a nation promise. I'm going to make you, Abraham, into a great nation. There's a name. I'm going to make your name great. And then the, the fourth element of this covenant is you're going to be a blessing to all. Now, from that time onward, the Old Testament is all about God's people their law, their land, and how God was developing them into a great nation. 
in all the principles involving the entire Old Testament look forward to in preparation of a kingdom or a church that would come. This is the foundation. This is the starting point. And this is the promise. I'm going to make you into a great nation. If you follow the line, you're going to end up in the church that Jesus built. That's where it ends in the New Testament. It all connects together. So this leads us to the next P, and that is the church was promised. Jesus promised, I will build my church. Now we've kind of got to get our minds away from the 21st century, the way our mindset is, you know, paradigm, the way we view church because of the world we're living in, and try to empty our mind of all of the stuff that's going on today when we hear the word church and try to get it back to the first century. You know what a paradigm is, right? Someone said, well, it's better than a pair of nickels. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. A paradigm is a way you view something. It's like looking through my glasses. I'm looking through this view of something. Sometimes we start viewing the church the way it's working today, but we've got to get our paradigm back to the first century. Jesus is the builder of the church. He said, it's my church. It's interesting to me that Jesus promised to build one church. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 4 and 4, there is one body. It's very clear that there's only one foundation. No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.11. And it's built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone in Ephesians 2 and 20. Which leads me to another P. That is, the church was also prophesied. We talked the other day about some strange visions that occurred in the book of Ezekiel. There's also some really weird ones in the book of Daniel. But one night this king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream. And in his dream, he saw this great big statue with a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay, and a crushing rock that came out of heaven and just destroyed it. Now, what does this dream have anything to do with us today? Well, if you study history, you realize that the head of gold represented something. And when Daniel came and explained to Nebuchadnezzar what he had dreamed and what it meant. He told him, he said, you're the head of gold. He, of course, was the head of what is called the Babylonian kingdom. And then after that was another worldwide power, the breast of silver, which was Persia in that kingdom. And then the thighs of bronze, which was Greece. And then you've got the legs of iron and feet of iron and clay, which you can't read that without thinking about Rome. Now, in Daniel 2 and 44, after Daniel had explained what this statue meant, notice what he said. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. This kingdom will not be left to other people. It will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, all these different kingdoms that the statue represented. And the Bible says that it will stand forever. Now, friends, that's prophesying about the kingdom of Christ. That's a prophecy about the church that Jesus promised to build. Isaiah tells us exactly where this kingdom would begin, where the church would be started. In Isaiah 2, it talks about in the latter days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established in the top of the mountains, exalted above the hills. All nations will flow into it. And out of Zion will go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, if we're going to pick up on this prophecy and see if we can figure out where it's, uh, where it's fulfilled, we've got to remember the pieces of it. It's in the mountains. And all nations are going to flow into it. And it's going to begin in Jerusalem. So what do we make of that? And and how can we go to the New Testament and find the fulfillment of this great prophecy? Well, I want to invite your attention to Luke chapter 24. Jesus has been resurrected. 
He's giving the apostles instructions, and he said, thus it is written, and thus it's necessary for Christ to suffer, rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins will be preached in his name. Notice, to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So we're finding, we're getting closer to the fulfillment of this prophecy back in Isaiah, or back in Daniel and Isaiah. Now, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, it says all nations had gathered together in Jerusalem. And Peter in Acts chapter 2 said, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. A very similar prophecy is found in Joel chapter 2. And he says, this is the fulfillment of it. He says that it will come to pass in the last days. God said, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. See, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out in a miraculous measure. The apostles began to speak with other tongues. People were hearing the language, uh, uh, their own native language. All nations had gathered together there. And here you've got the fulfillment of the prophecy that was written hundreds of years before then. Now, a quick little trick, if you want to remember all these prophecies, Remember the twos. This helps me in my Bible study. Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, Joel 2, Acts 2, and Ephesians 2 all connect. They're all prophecies of the church or the fulfillment of those prophecies. So don't forget the twos. If you're trying to remember in Bible study, you're talking with someone, where's that at? I know it's in Daniel, Daniel 2 or Isaiah 2. Now, this brings me to another P that I want to talk about. The church was purchased. It was purchased. We often determine the value of something by what you pay for it. You know, if you go to a garage sale and you pick up uh, a beautiful dress or whatever, or you go somewhere and it's a bargain price and someone says, what'd you pay for that? Don't tell them, you know, if it looks good. In other words, if you say, well, I paid a dollar fifty then the value goes down. I'm just saying that, you know, sometimes we, we determine value by the price paid. Well, the church came at a great price. It took the blood of Jesus to purchase the church. The church was purchased with the blood of Christ, Acts 20, verse 28. Hebrews says that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, Hebrews 9, 22. Hebrew, Ephesians 1 and 7 talks about we have redemption through His blood even the forgiveness of sins. Have you ever thought about these three things are forever bound together from those scriptures? You cannot separate these three things because God bound them together and that's the blood of Jesus, the church, and forgiveness. Those three things are eternally bound and you can't have, uh, you can't have forgiveness without the blood of Jesus. You can't have forgiveness without being a member of His body that He built because we are the body of Christ. Another P, finally, the final one I want to talk about, and then we'll move on to another section of our study, the church was perfected. Let me ask a question. How essential is the church? Some people say, you know, the church, I, I just don't do religion anymore, you know. I, you know, I got burned. Things didn't work out. But, oh, I love Jesus. And it's important that I remain connected to Him. But I want you to consider something with me this morning. As you think about, is it really important to be a member of the Lord's church? Here's something to consider. Jesus built the church. Jesus died for the church. He purchased the church with His blood. The Bible says He washed and cleansed the church. It says He's the Savior and will come again to own and to, and, or to claim uh, the church. So how can I say the church is not essential or not important? Unto Him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus to all generations, Ephesians 3, 21. Jesus loved the church and we need to love what Jesus loved. Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. This afternoon, I'm going to spend a little more time talking about how everyone has a part in the church. We're all important. 
And we all are joined together and this whole body is knit together as every part does its share in Ephesians chapter 4. Now let's proceed on. Let's spend a few moments and talk about, well, how is the church described in Scripture? You know, first of all, the church is referred to as the kingdom. Over there in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2 and 12, walk worthy of God who calls you into His own kingdom and glory. Of course, Colossians 3 says He's conveyed us or translated us into the kingdom of His Son. Now, the word church and kingdom do not mean the same thing, but they can refer to the same organization or the same body. The kingdom is referring to the government aspect of the church, that Jesus is our king. And the church, as we've already learned, is referring that we are the called out. We're the ecclesia. So both, both words, kingdom and church, are used by Jesus. In fact, he used them in one passage together. Upon this rock I'll build my church. And I'll give unto you the keys of the kingdom. See how they are interrelated, but they refer to different aspects. Every kingdom has at least three parts, right? You got to have a king, you got to have a law, you got to have citizens. Jesus is our king. We have a law, the perfect law of liberty, James 1 25, and there are citizens, and those citizens are members of the body. So the church is not a democracy or a republic, but it's a kingdom with a ruling king, King Jesus. This is the kingdom that John said was at hand, John the Baptist. This is the kingdom Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world's. Christ's kingdom is unlike any other kingdom on the face of the globe. Other kingdoms are established and defended by armed forces and unwilling subjects at times. There's not one unwilling subject in the kingdom of Jesus. You're not in the kingdom if you're not willing. The kingdom of our Lord never had an unwilling subject, but whosoever will may come. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let's have grace, where we, by we can serve God with reverence and godly fear. You know, the church is also called the house of God. How to conduct yourself in the house of God. Hebrews 3 and 6, whose house we are. Church is referred to as the family of God. God had said, I'll be a father to you. You'll be my sons and daughters. Isn't it wonderful that we're all family? We're all related to one another as members of the church. We've been adopted as sons, according to Galatians 4 and 5 and Romans 8. Now, what do you get if you're in a, in a family? Unless it's a dysfunctional family, you, you expect to have some things in a family. You've got love, hopefully. In a family, you've got acceptance and protection and care and provision and discipline for your benefit and training and instruction. Did you know all of those things are true with the church that Jesus built? Don't you want to be a part of a church where love is there? Without love, war, we are nothing. We're talking about Miles King, a few of us this week. I heard him in Sulphur one year say, I can't hardly say it without imitating him, but he said, we've all seen a nits brass, uh, bristle, a gnat's bristle, I should say. It's just a little. He said, without love, you're not even gnat's bristle. You're nothing. Well, <laughs> that's certainly true, isn't it? You're not even a gnat's bristle. You're absolutely nothing, Paul said, without love. We need that acceptance, and we're accepted when we do God's will. We need protection. And we have a way of escape when we're tempted. Care and provision. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom. All these things will be added to you. Discipline for your benefit. Hebrews 12, if, you're, if you don't have discipline, you're not even a legitimate child. And then, of course, there's training and instruction by the word of God. You know, the church is also referred to as the body of Christ, which is his body. Ephesians 1, 23 Romans 12, 4 and 5, where we have many members, but one body. 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the members should have the same care one for another. The fact that, that we're related, you know, we can speak plainly to one another. We can correct one another whenever we see there's danger. If love is flowing, 
And so I, I just think we need to really meditate on how wonderful it is that you and I can be part of a family. And just remember there's people in the world that they're hungering and thirsting for family. We have the opportunity and privilege to invite them in to be a part of the body of Christ. Become part of your family right here in the Northwest. And that brings us to the people of God. We're the people of God, according to 1 Peter 2. When Israel was called out, the church, uh, they were called out in the Old Testament, just like they were called out, we're called out in the New Testament. Israel was God's chosen people. They were a royal priesthood. They were a peculiar people. That didn't mean they were weird. It just meant that uh, they were a special people and they were a holy nation. And all of that is true in the church today. And it's interesting that Peter picked up on every one of those expressions from the Old Testament and he referred it to the New Testament. That's what we are. We're a church, just like they were, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special or peculiar people. That's us today. So he took those same terms in two verses and applied it to the church. Well, what do you call the church? You know, what name is there? Well, interestingly enough, there's a lot of names. You know, the Bible refers to the church in many ways. Body of Christ, I won't read them all. House of Christ, house of God, God's building, the church, the church of God. Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, the churches of Christ salute you. You're a royal priesthood. On and on we could go. There are many names in the New Testament referring to the church. As we enter the final moments of our study this morning, I want to ask, well, what about the destiny of the church? You know, the church is the only organization on earth whose history transcends time. We learned last night it was in God's mind from the beginning. And its future is eternal. There's a verse in Revelation. Some of us talked briefly about the book of Revelation this week. There's a, book, there's a verse in Revelation that some people say that's the theme, that's the hub of it, that's the whole theme of the entire Revelation letter. And I'm not so sure that's not right. That verse is Revelation 17 and 14. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. Now, there's a lot of things I don't understand about the book of Revelation. I'm like one of our brothers down around Orange, California. I told one of you this week, he's doing the chapter study. He came across the beast with seven heads, and he read it, and he said, then there's a beast with seven heads. He said, brothers, I don't know what that thing was but I'd hate to meet it in a dark alley. Next verse. Well, that's kind of the way I am about a lot of these figures in the book of Revelation. But I know one thing about the book of Revelation. Two words, we win. We win. We overcome. And that is the theme of the book. What's the destiny of the church? Well, the destiny of the church is very simple. Jesus was raised from the dead. We have the same destiny that he has. He was raised from the dead, we'll be raised from the dead in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, verses 20 and 49. Another thing that, that I know about the church is we're going to have a body like Jesus. Isn't that amazing to think about, to have a body like Jesus? He's going to transform our lowly body so it'll be like His glorious body. 1 John 3 and 2 says, we know when He's revealed, we'll be like Him for we'll see him as he is. Another thing I know about the destiny of the church is that we'll be with the Lord forever. In John 11, Mary was, uh, uh, Jesus appears to Mary, or is talking to Mary, after Lazarus died, and Jesus said this, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then she turned to Mary and she said, do you believe this? That's a pretty good question for us. How about us? Do you believe this? Do you believe that we can live and never die? This brings me to 
a passage I need to notice real quick. How do you get into the kingdom? It's very simple. Jesus was approached by Nicodemus at night for some reason. And he said, Lord, we know you're a teacher come from heaven. No man can do what you're doing. And Jesus seemed to ignore the, the compliment and just said, unless you're born again, you can't even enter the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus is confused. How? How can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter a second time to his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, uh, he said, I'll tell you the truth, unless you're born of the water and of the spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. So how do we become a part of the kingdom in the Lord's church? We have to be born again or we'll never enter it. We're born of the water and of the spirit. Certainly the word of God is very, very active and relevant in our salvation. And so is a birth of water. If you read the context of John and you see how the word water is used, it doesn't take long to realize that there's reference here to baptism into Christ, which is how we enter Christ. Well, let's get to the final points of our study. But keep in mind, you can be born again of the water and the Spirit. If you haven't done that, we hope you will today. But I want to just kind of sum up everything we've covered in our conclusion here. Going back to where we started, and that's with Noah and the ark. There's uh, two or three passages I want you to look at very quickly with me, and it kind of just ties the whole lesson together like bookends. We started with Noah. We end with Noah. I want you to look at 1 Peter 3 right quick. He's talking about people that formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, wherein few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. It's not a bath, not a removal of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the English Standard Version. Now this will be a day of great surprises. There's a fascinating passage I've thought of so many times in Luke 17. Jesus said, just like it was in the days of Noah. That's the way it'll be when the Son of Man comes. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. Everything's just going along like it always had. You know, they're having a wedding, everything's going great. And then it says, until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came, destroyed them all. We're going to be going about our daily lives thinking, you know, we got plenty of time and we got a marriage, you know, we got this going on. We got a business that we're working. But one day Noah entered that ark and everything changed that day. One day Jesus is coming back. Peter talked about it in 2 Peter 3. He says scoffers are going to come in the last days. They're going to uh, walk according to their lust. They're going to say, Where, where's this promise he gave us? He said, since our fathers fell asleep, everything goes on as it always has. These were the determinists. They said, you know, everything, there's four seasons, spring, summer, winter, fall. The sun rises in the east, sets in the west. It's been going on all our lives, all our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents' lives. There's no room for the second coming of Jesus because everything just goes on like it always has. But notice what Peter said. This they willfully forget. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished. He said they forgot the flood. They forgot that everything hasn't always been like it always was because they're overlooking the flood when God interrupted the, the usual events of nature. And then he goes on to say the same way that the world was flooded with water, the day is coming when the world will be flooded with fire. He said, don't forget this one thing. We better listen. Here's one thing he doesn't want us to forget. And this is our final verse of the study. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some count slackness, he's long-suffering. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. That's why the world hadn't ended, because God's being patient with you. He's wanting you to repent. 
He's wanting you to obey the gospel. But, verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Just like God destroyed this world by water, the Lord promises one day the earth will be destroyed by fire. And the message for us is to be ready. Are you a member of the Lord's church? Have you obeyed the gospel? Have you come knowing that Jesus and believing it with all of your heart, Jesus is the Son of God. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. I'm ready to turn from sin, repent, have a new life. I'm ready to confess his name. And I'm ready to be baptized for the forgiveness of my sins. Why not today? You know, we can make a lot of excuses for putting off salvation. And uh, we can come up with all kinds of reasons. But if you were there in the days of the ark, when the thunder cracked, you know, the one thing you, the only thing you'd want is to get on that boat. We need to look at this today with that kind of urgency. Let's get on the boat. Let's get ready to meet the Lord. Won't you come while together we stand and sing?